So the lecture is going to be on Assyrian nationalism, part one. And I would like to begin by telling you a little anecdotal story of an experience I had a number of years ago. Um, well, maybe more than 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah, I would say more than 30 years ago. While I was, I was at the University of Chicago studying international relations, um, my main focus was international politics at that time and the relations between nations. And um, one day I was walking in the hallway of the, uh, uh, one of the buildings at the university and I saw an advertisement for a lecture for what, is what was known as the Arabic Circle. I think the university still has this lecture where the person lecturing would speak in the Arabic language. And even though I was really not well-versed in Arabic, I thought because the topic was Assyrians, uh, I thought I would attend. Now the topic was Ad-Din wal hadar al-Ashuriyin, which means the religion and the civilization of the Assyrians. And the lecturer at this Arabic circle was Mar Saka, who was a bishop in the Syriac Orthodox Church and um, was a well-noted scholar, a well-known scholar of uh, Syriac uh, or, or Assyrian. And um, so I, I walked to the room and I waited and there I saw the bishop, along with a priest and another person accompanying him, um, approach. And uh, I shook his hand and uh, welcomed him in uh, the Eastern Assyrian dialect, our Eastern, what we call Eastern Syriac. If you've been in the class, you know the difference between these two. And he, of course, being from the village of Bartulla in North Iraq, in the Nineveh Plain, spoke um, our dialect, slightly different, asked me uh, how I was doing and, and uh, what I was studying here. And I told him I'm studying politics. And, uh, and he said, well, everything is politics in this world. We joked around. He went in, began his presentation. Remember the title of the lecture was Ad-Din wal Hadarat al-Ashuriyin, which means the religion and the civilization of the Assyrians. So once he began lecturing, um, or excuse me, once he was introduced by a student in the Arabic language, uh, the student said, and now his grace will speak on, in Arabic, of course, will speak on. As soon as he said the title, the bishop protested. He said, no, wait a minute, not Ashuriyin, we are Syrian, we are Syriacs, we are not Assyrians. There is a difference. And farq bil Ashurin was Syrian. There, there is a difference between the Assyrians and Syriacs. We are not the same people. And the student, of course, was startled. The room was full of uh, professors who were, one of them was Rashid Khalidi, one of them was Dr. Edward Odishu, um, who was a linguist. Professor Rashid Khalidi is a noted Palestinian scholar who's teaching at the University of Columbia now. And there were many others, uh, professors there. And they were kind of like astonished by the insistence of the bishop to differentiate um, in this way, in this very, very aggressive way. And, um, and, and so the student was startled and said, okay, um, you know, no problem, I understand, um, and said Syrian. At the end of the lecture, or in the middle of the lecture, the, the um, bishop was asked, how do you refer to yourself in your language? And he said, Suraya, uh, or Suriaya, or Suryoyo. And, and he said, but we don't, when we say this word, we do not mean, uh, we do not mean uh, any ethnicity by it. We mean simply Christian. We, we are simply Christians as if in the abstract. We are Christians, no more than that. And 
and towards the end of the class, and, and so he, and by the way, he asked me, he said, what, what do you call yourself? Uh, he, he pointed to me, he said, he is from um, the Church of the East. He is uh, uh, um, a member of the Church of the East, uh, Eastern Syriac. And, and so he, he looked at me and he asked me, what do you, what does Suraya mean to you? And I said, Assyrian. And, um, and he said, he shrugged his shoulders. He said, oh, well. As soon as I was done, another professor asked, um, because he was placing so much difference uh, on this um, Assyrian Syriac division, um, he was asked by one of the professors who was uh, an Egyptian professor teaching Arabic at the university. He, he said, Sayyidna, you know, our Lord, um, you know, our master, a term of respect for the bishop. He said, there is no difference. Now the professor meant between Assyrian and Syriac. And the bishop, as soon as he heard this, he said, yes, you're right. If you call us Arabs, that's fine. We are Arabs. And I was a little bit astonished and held back my questioning. And I, I remember just feeling very bewildered, if nothing else. And and I, I went outside and I waited for him and I, and I said, um, your grace, I, I was a little bit confused. Um, you know, you said this. And as soon as I began to ask, he kind of read my mind as to what I was going to ask him. And he said, you don't understand. And then the priest came between us and he said, please, he's going from Iraq to Damascus. It's a very sensitive situation. Please. Do not bring these things up. So what he was in effect saying is, I have a public stance on the issue of ethnicity. Remember, I live in a Ba'athist Arab nationalist atmosphere and environment. And so I do not want to cause a conflict for myself or for my people by insisting on being a separate ethnicity. Do you understand me, please? Um, as if he was pleading with us. And so, um, so we left the topic and, and that was the end of it. I want you to keep this little story in mind. Um, it was an experience for me and I got to know that uh, indeed there are people who speak our language and who come from the same place that we do and who share our culture, our faith, but do not share the vision that I had or the understanding or the imagination that I had. And these terms are going to be important as we study nationalism as it is understood by various scholars. So we will talk about the introduction to nationalism, we want to understand what this phenomenon is in history. What is it exactly, nationalism? What does it refer to? What does it do? We're going to be speaking about mobilization of nationalist elements and thinking in Urmi in particular, and we will extend this um, in the next class, especially, but we're going to refer to it today. And then we're going to refer, refer refer, excuse me, to the various, what I call voices in the wilderness, the nascent Assyrian nationalist voices, such as Ashur Yusuf, Freydun Aturaya, or Freydun Bet Auraham, Benjamin Arsanis, Naum Fayr, Hakim Baba Parhat, and others. Now, I'm going to refer just to kind of give you an idea of how relevant this topic is still today. Um, just recently, the patriarch of the Chaldean church, um, uh, his beatitude, Mar Luis Sacco, wrote to the Kurdistan regional government's head, Mr. Masrur Barazani, and asked that, mocked, in a way, the um, title or the, the um, commonly used um, Chaldean, Syriac, Assyrian um, 
uh, phrasing for our people in Iraq and said, I don't, we do not. And this is the third time he wrote, the letter was written in, in February last month. Um, we do not want to be referred to as Chaldean Syriac Assyrians. We insist on being referred to and recognized as Chaldeans. We are separate and we want to be referred to as Chaldeans. We, we do not want to be put in the same category as, um, as Syriacs and Assyrians. They are separate, separate but equal. And this is the vision. Now, as we keep this in mind, as we go into the understanding of nationalism as espoused by various scholars, keep this in mind, this vision of separating rather than bringing together. Now, countering this view 100 years ago were people like Freydun bet Oraham, known as Freydun bet uh, or Freydun Aturaya, Dr. Freydun Aturaya, who called for the unification of his people, who called for the bringing together of his people. Now, one could say, as we go through the various viewpoints by uh, the scholars, one could say, well, that was his vision, and it really was a product of his time. What was necessary then may not be necessary today. In all fairness, um, looking at it from a neutral perspective. Keep in mind also, when we talked about the division of the Assyrians during the massacres of Badr Khan and Nurallah in 1843 and 1846, keep that in mind. As we discuss how these ideas shaped or took apart the Assyrian people whether Assyrians really believed in something called nationalism that encompassed every sect, every tribe, or uh, whether they did not really adhere to such ideas. And uh, what was the politics, what was the political result or the consequence of not believing or believing in some cases? Now, what is nationalism? It certainly is a way of thinking. And oftentimes we are told that the nation should be at the center of our thoughts or at the high end of our thoughts. Our ethnic group or nation should rule itself. And you'll see this repeated again by different scholars. As nationalists, we think the best way to make this happen and avoid control uh, or oppression by others is for each group to have their own nation. And the nation should have power. It's basically uh, nationalism centers the nation, the ethnic group, if you will. And you will hear some scholars say, well, even if the nation doesn't really exist, we can make it exist and form it into a nation. Um, and you'll hear others disagree with this view. According to Leah Greenfield, um, five roads to modernity, because oftentimes nationalism is associated with modernity. For, for many of the scholars, for most scholars, I would say. The only foundation of nationalism as such, the only condition that is, without which no nationalism is possible is an idea. Nationalism is a particular perspective or style of thought. The idea which lies at the core of nationalism is the idea of the nation. So if there is no nation, according to Greenfield uh, or Greenfeld, there is no nationalism. Now, Ernest Gellner is an interesting scholar who's written extensively about nationalism um, in his book, uh, Nations and Nationalism and um, uh, Thought and Change. The general imposition of a high culture on society where previously low cultures had taken up the lives of the majority, in other words, for example, tribal culture. And in some cases, the totality of the population. It means the general diffusion of school mediated, academy supervised idiom, codified for the requirements of a reasonably precise bureaucratic and technological communication. It is the establishment of an anonymous impersonal society 
with mutually sustainable atomized individuals held together above all by a shared culture of this kind in place of the previous complex culture of local groups sustained by folk cultures reproduced locally and idiosyncratically by the microgroups themselves. What the hell does that mean? It means that nationalism is really imposed on the cult existing cultures. So for example, tribal cultures. And I'll give you an example uh, uh, using the Assyrian uh, case. Um, the dress of the various tribes, for example. So we have the dress of the people of al -Qush, the dress of the people of um, Tiari, the dress of the people of um, Urmia, the dress of Baz, and so on and so forth. Okay, multiple different types of dress. Well, we will transform all of these into one uh, if we have a central, powerful government, transform these and superimpose on all of these complicated, and, and it doesn't have to be dress, of course, it could be any uh, type of cultural product or, or cultural expression, uh, even, even, for example, dialect. So superimpose our version, which is the nationalistic version that ties everybody together. In other words, uniform culture upon these societies, upon the entirety of the society. So the general imposition of high culture is what Gellner refers to it, upon the complex of cultures existing in actual society. And, and he refers to school-mediated academy-supervised idiom codified for the requirements of a reasonably precise bureaucratic and technological communication. So in the case of the United States, in the case of the Assyrians, I gave an example which hasn't materialized because of the lack of a powerful central government among the Assyrians. But in the case of the United States, for example, various things like the stories of uh, George Washington, American exceptionalism to be superimposed on the lives of people who may not necessarily share these things, who are forced to imagine them, for example. So Ernest Gellner's theory has been characterized as possessing, and by the way, don't, don't uh, overwhelm yourself with trying to fully understand uh, these theories. If you do, great. If you don't, if it's as clear as mud, don't worry about it. Things will become clearer towards the end of this class because we will give real life examples and I will go back to, to these theoretical foundations. Ernest Gellner's theory has been characterized as possessing elements of functional and psychological theories of nationalism. Psychological theory's usual point of departure is to assume that the need to identify with or belong to an entity larger than oneself becomes important in times of change when previous systems of identification are undermined. So for example, if we look at, and I'll again, come back to this, when we look at the fragmentation of village life, the, the disruption of village life where people move to the city from the village where in the previous uh, life association with village practices, with village address, with village dialect, were one thing and now we're changing um, this, this, and you will see this with Assyrians in Urmia, for example, when, when Assyrians transform from being members of the Church of the East, for example, into various other denominations, Russian Orthodox, um, American Evangelicals, uh, French Catholics, and so on. There is a need to belong psychological need to belong, according to Gellner, to something that is kind of solid and one could identify. Who am I? What's going on here? You know, we were one, members of the Church of the East, for example, in Urmia, and now we are so many. What is going on? So these systems, previous systems, are being undermined. Now, Gellner is not thinking about the Assyrians here. He's giving a theory that we are applying to the Assyrian example. 
One's identification with one's role in a village, for example, becomes undermined when that village undergoes an industrial transformation, as we said, which disrupts all traditional ties between the inhabitants and changes the roles they once possessed. In such a case, people of the changed village can no longer identify with their roles, which have disappeared, but must find another identity, which is ethnicity or nationality. So who am I? What do I stand for? In functional theory, nationalism is perceived to be the guiding uh, to be guiding the rapid process of modernization by bringing the various divided factions, tribal, religious, regional, etc., together to build a significant population ready to be mobilized by the state. Nationalism, in other words, exists because it serves a purpose of function. Keep in mind the Assyrian ex experience of 1843 and 1846 when we're discussing these theoretical frameworks and why nationalism um, could be mobilized. And ask yourself, as you think about the past experience of the Assyrians, could things have been done differently um, by, for example, Mar Shimon, Mar Oraham Shimon, who was grappling with um, the growing Ottoman centralization during the time of Badr Khan and Nurallah in Hakari and Botan, what was he thinking? Was he possibly thinking these things without exactly articulating them? He wasn't saying nationalism, but was he thinking of bringing his people together, really doing everything but labeling it as nationalistic or not? Think about it. Gellner begins his theory by postulating that society has a structure and a culture, as, as we said. He defines relations concerning the role of a person in society as part of structure and those governing expressions such as dress, part of culture. According to Gellner, nations can be invented. Nationalism is not the awakening of nations to self-consciousness. It invents nations where they do not exist, but it does need some pre-existing differentiating marks to work on, even if these are purely negative. In other words, consisting of disqualifying marks from entry to privilege without any positive similarity um, between those who share the disqualification and who are destined to form a new nation. So where nations do not exist, we look for markers, we can make them exist. According to John uh, Bruley um, at the London School of Economics, to focus upon culture, ideology, identity, or class, class or modernization is to neglect the fundamental point that nationalism is above and beyond all else about politics and politics is about power. So according to another theorist here, Gellner is a little bit off. Really what this is about is mobilizing about preserving and maintaining and perhaps increasing power. That's what nationalism is really about. It's a negotiating tool. And his definition of nationalism is that there must exist a nation, that the interest and values of such nation take priority over other values and interests, and that the nation must be as independent as possible. Now, separate and apart from other theorists, um, we have Benedict Anderson, who came with a very seminal book in the study of nationalism. And he said, hold on, everyone, we have to think differently about nationalism. Nationalism is a state of mind that perceives the nation, that imagines the nation as central to one's life and collectivity, but it essentially is about imagination. And he, uh, his book is imagined communities. It's a little bit cut off here. And Anderson defined the nation as an imagined political community and imagined as both inherently um, limited and sovereign. Limited meaning it has borders. Not everyone can be part of our nation. 
and it's sovereign. It should be an entity ruling itself. It is imagined because the members of even the smallest nations will never know most of their fellow members, meet them or even hear of them. Yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. So in other words, you know, we don't know each other, um, but our imagination tells us that we should. Now think about the example of my encounter with the bishop of the Syriac Orthodox Church. What did I imagine before? Was my imagination completely off? What did I think of the bishop? Was he a member of my people? Well, he certainly didn't share the same imagination. So now we have a, a conflict here of, of what it is that we envision as our nation. Think about Mar Luis Sacco's understanding of the nation. What is his nation? Is it the Assyrian nation that is united? Is it the Syriac speaking people? Or is it a separate Chaldean nation and church? And what role does politics play? We heard John Bruley talk about essentially nationalism is a political game that is being played. It's a negotiating tactic and really not so much about thought as much about acquiring and maintaining power. So according to um, uh, Anderson, Benedict Anderson, nationalism came about with things like printing and of course it's a modern um it's a modern phenomenon it's not hasn't existed throughout time and he places a great importance on people reading the same thing and envisioning the same thing so everyone is kind of reading about something and envisioning it so everybody comes together because we have this uh communion okay um which is obtained through reading newspapers, for example, reading the same thing, uh, similar to taking communion, okay? Uh, we all do the same thing, and so it brings us together. But in this case, the print media has acted uh, to, at the behest of the government, of course, that, it, that wants to encourage the creation and the maintaining and the empowerment of the nation to um, espouse this oneness among people for political power, John Bruley would say. Now, there are many, many scholars who sort of in different shades um, say the same thing about modernity and nationalism, that nationalism was certainly not an ancient phenomenon, but you have um, recent scholars who have begun to question the idea that um, that the nation was really a modern phenomenon that, that arose after the French Revolution and after the coming of modernization and industrialization. And according to one such scholar who is at the uh, University of Tel Aviv, ethnicity made the state and the state made ethnicity. <clears throat> In other words, both acted to create each other. Indeed, both um, these threads of causation reveal how highly political ethnicity has always been, how highly political ethnicity has always been. Why would the state strive to homogenize its realm where possible, were it not for the fact that a sense of common identity immeasurably fostered the people's loyalty, legitimized political rule, and helped to sustain the state's integrity and independence? God doesn't understand why, if ethnicity did not exist, if there was no common basis, why would the state act, in other words, in the interest of that very basis which existed? Contrary to a widespread view, state building is a pre-existing ethnic space, uh, has a state building in a pre-existing ethnic space has been exceedingly easier than ethno building. What Anthony Smith, who is another theorist, um, has claimed for modern nations was also true for pre-modern national states. 
and we are told that, hey, wait a minute, this is not a new phenomenon here. There's something that existed before, and we should readily accept that as social scientists. And so God tells us, contrary to the Euro European bias of literature on national phenomenon, already challenged by other leading critics of modernism, and, and of course, we, we talked about Bruley, we talked about Gellner, we talked about Anderson. Asia, where states evolved the earliest, is also where some of the most ancient national estates can be found. So our Europeans here, and specifically Western social scientists, ignoring something. From about 3000 BC, unified Egypt emerged as the world's first large territorial national state, congruent with a distinct people of shared ethnicity and culture. This indeed was the secret of its remarkable endurance for nearly three millennia. Further east, the small national states of Israel, Ammon, Moab, and Edom, together with, I, I would disagree with uh, Professor Gatt here about these states, together with other incipient national states and city-states in the ancient Near East were destroyed by Assyria, the region's first territorial empire. Indeed, Assyria became the first in a series of empires that henceforth would constitute the standard in Southwest Asia, replacing one another down to the 20th century. Thus, the pristine emergence of national states in that part of the world was interrupted by the rise and triumph of imperial juggernauts, in other words, colonialism. Hence, Ili Kaduri's sweeping and misleading assertion that nationalism and the national state were alien to Asia. So Ili Kaduri, um, who was an Iraqi um, uh, Jewish uh, of the Jewish faith, um, believed that nationalism was unknown in Asia and national states, these entities were really not known, which is, according to Azar Ghat, uh, not the case. So uh, according to Ghat, these states actually in Asia existed. So there was ethnic, uh, an ethnic basis for a state. So the idea of the nation state, if you will, for example, we often think of a united Germany, which came together in the 1800s, or a united Italy formed some of the very first nation states. Well, according to Gat, the ancient um, land of Egypt, and Assyria specifically, um, had formed um, something very similar. And actually, there are various articles written on the understanding of identity of ancient Assyrians, but of course, that's in the ancient past. We discussed some of these, the formation of identity of the Assyrian state. But certainly the idea of nationalism is something that most scholars fear, unlike God, is really a very new phenomenon. Now, Gott also critiques Anderson. And he says his mistake is twofold. First, the view that universal religious identity preceded national identity ignores, because this is what Anderson says, ignores the national religions of most peoples before the rise of universal religions, as well as the strongly national character and bias of local churches of universal faiths, including Christianity, both Western and Eastern. Think about here of the Church of the East's nationalistic aspirations. Think about the Chaldean Church's nationalist aspirations or the Syriac Orthodox Church, or the Armenian Church. Overwhelmingly, nationalist, national churches tended to champion the patriotic cause in case of a threat or conflict. Indeed, they often kept the national spirit alive, even when the state itself was destroyed and the country was occupied by a foreign invader. The lower clergy in particular, closer to the people in their way of life and sentiments, often assuming leadership positions at the local level and free from considerations of high politics, tended to be staunchly patriotic or nationalistic. Rather than conflicting with the national idea, religion was one of its strongest pillars. That's an interesting observation. Anderson, and think again about Mar Oraham Shumun during the time of the uh, conquest of the Assyrian Hakkadi Mountains in 1843 and 1846. 
What was Mar Oraham Shimon trying to do by leading the tribes as a unified force? What was he trying to do? Anderson's emphasis on literacy and print technology has been much exaggerated. Remember, we said that Anderson theorized that the coming of nationalism had a lot to do with print technology, as well as, of course, its prerequisite literacy. Because illiterate societies had their own potent means of wide scale cultural transmission, oral epics, such as Qatine, Gabbara, for example, recited by wandering bards and celebrating gods, kings, heroes, and people, always ours, served. He's not talking about Assyrians here, but, but apply this to the Assyrian example, served as a major vehicle of cultural dissemination. It is all too often forgotten that although the masses in historical state societies could not read, they were commonly read to. They were read to and preached to in the vernacular by the literati in ceremonies and public gatherings. The effects of all these factors on the consolidation of large-scale imagined communities cannot be overstated. <clears throat> so what we are being told by Gott here is that the theories of Anderson and others as to the requisite phenomenon of large print media, large uh, uh, the printing houses and, and literacy as being required for the building of nationalisms is exaggerated. Because remember that people got to know that they were in effect in communion with others through other means. It didn't have to be print media. So here we have a clash of ideas, a clash of understanding, just so you, you understand there are different theories concerning the origins of nationalism. And of course, Gat has his critics as well. Now, one of the interesting uh, formations of nationalisms and the recreation of, of an entity is Zionism. The Zionist reading of Jewish history was an important facet of its political agenda. In fact, Zionist collective memory provided ideological, the ideological framework for an understanding and legitimization, legitimizing its vision for the future. The predominantly secular Zionist movement, keep in mind, they were not religious, the early nationalists, turned away from traditional Jewish memory in order to construct its own counter memory of the Jewish past. Remember what Gellner said about superimposing the new culture onto the existing older culture, you know, the divisions, the tribal, the sectarian, and so on, superimposing it on that culture. So, so think about how the Zionist movement transformed a, the Jewish vision of the past. In its call for change and its critical attitude toward Jewish life, culture, and values in exile, the Zionist interpretation of history had a strong anti-traditional thrust. Well, that's sort of interesting, isn't it? You would think that if you're interested in history, you're interested in tradition. No, contrary according to um, this author. While the religious Zionist grappled with the vision of the future, religious Zionists, the secular Zionists were more concerned with reshaping the past because the past is a symbol that brings us together. It's the superimposition of what we understand of the past, how unified it should be for a political purpose for empowerment. A very interesting study, um, I, I will talk about more my own research about Assyrian nationalism and, um, and how I believe Assyrian nationalism came about in Odomi specifically, but I, but I want to refer to others as well. Um, Adam Becker is, has written a um, an incredibly um, well-documented book, um, very well-written, very uh, important for the history of nationalism. I disagree with, um, I think he's got it wrong uh, in a lot of things, but it's worth quoting Adam Becker 
uh, the origins of Assyrian nationalism and of social imagery in which the nation could be conceptualized as a montage must be understood within the Assyrians encounter with foreign missionaries, especially American evangelicals. So this is a big point made by himself and uh, Professor John Joseph, that really Assyrians had no way to understand nationalism. Again, Gat would disagree with this uh, view that they had no understanding until they encountered American evangelicals, interacted with them, built up their print media, um, fully understood Western ideas, and then picked up um, Western understandings of, of archaeology and nationalism and so on from Westerners. In other words, the Assyrians were completely clueless as to the formation of their own nation. They really, in effect, copied everything from outsiders. The use of Assyrian derives from Western sources, not from a continuity of identity between the ancient Assyrians and modern ones. So I think he has it wrong here, but we will give Adam Becker a voice because we are neutral and objective. Now, I would categorize Assyrian nationalism um, in three sort of areas so that we understand, you know, and, and, and the purpose we do this, the purpose for, the purpose here is that we do this to kind of categorize in our minds. It helps us to remember there are three primary periods that I think are important to remember in the formation of modern Assyrian nationalism. The first is from about 1890 to 1914, the role of intellectuals until the First World War begins. The role of intellectuals, the kind of cultural transmission of Assyrianism. The second period from 1915 to 1933, patriarchs and Maliks and others who rose to prominent positions such as Arapatros, uh, Rafael Khan and others within the Assyrian nation represents a movement. Okay, they lead a movement, an actual physical movement to try to do something. And then the third period from 1934 after the massacre of Samele, the end of the Assyrian question, and I put that in quote marks for a reason, and we will come to this in other classes as well. The end of the Assyrian question in the Middle East and the beginning of the Assyrian diaspora, diaspora nationalism, and also a, um, a movement that kind of goes underground after, after 1933. And by the way, I want to tell you that prior to 1933, a very prominent, another prominent bishop who became patriarch of the Syrian Orthodox Church was Marafram Barsoum. Uh, he advocated for the creation of Assyria soon after the First World War, um, uh, advocated that he belonged to the Assyrian nation, and so on and so forth. And then after 1933, uh, wrote a pamphlet that advocated a distancing um, of the Syriac Orthodox from the word Assyrian. Why was that? Again, keep in mind what John Bruley said about what nationalism is uh, in terms of politics, acquiring and maintaining power. And at some stage, you have to think it's not just about power, it's about survival. Now, one of the people who is a very uh, important figure is Yohannan Mushi in Urmia in 1913. Uh, this, this photograph is taken, he is the editor of Kihwa, um, which is called a lone star in the firmament. Uh, ha Kihwa uh, Gurqi'a. Um, uh, a Kihwa uh, existing by itself because this was the true voice of the Assyrian nationalists, which advocated for a number of years the formation of a new sentiment among the Assyrians to try to re um, understand their history, 
to try to revisit their history, to try to superimpose a new type of thinking, a new language, if you will, on what ties us together because we are coming apart. Why are we coming apart? Because for so long we associated ourselves, we knew who we were, okay, Suriae or Suraya, but we were affiliated with churches. The main institutions that kept us together were the Syriac Orthodox Church, the Chaldean Church, the Church of the East, and in Urmi in particular, it was basically the Church of the East. Well, now what do we have? Now we have the Assyrians who converted to the Russian Orthodox Church, Assyrians who converted to the American Evangelical Church, Assyrians who converted with French Catholics, Assyrians who, uh, less so with the Anglicans, but other faiths. And so what then ties us together? And so Kichwa comes along. And this is from 1906, more than 100 years ago. The primary aspiration of Kichwa is to unite the millet, umta, through love and unity, which are the cornerstone of the millet, love and unity. Today, we are not one church as we were 70 or 100 years ago. We no longer have nationalistic sentiments meaning milatayuta, milatayuta, meaning the togetherness that we had. Even in spelling and publishing, we are divided. This unusual case is not found in any nation that perceives itself civilized. There are hundreds of such deficiencies that pertain to us Assyrians. Keep in mind what Gellner said. To unite the nation through letters, and I of superimposing a larger culture, just as the Zionists had done. Two, to unite the nation through letters, communication, essays, and news that find their way in this paper. Does that sound familiar now in terms of theory, Benedict Anderson? Our people are scattered in Turkey, Ottoman Empire, Iran, Russia, and America. There are signs that this diaspora will greatly increase. Boy, did it ever. And year after year, it will decrease the number of those who still reside in their own homeland. Now, we have to stop and think about this. This is written in 1906. I don't think the editors of Kichwa envisioned the horror that um, we would see today in terms of decrease the number of those who still reside in their own homeland. I mean, in Iraq alone, the number of our people went down from 1.5 million or so to possibly 100,000. So that today, more than 95% of our people are outside of their homeland. Kichwa will strive to be a catalyst for the advancement of education and culture, a form for the exchange of nationalistic ideas and discussions. Kichwa will not become a device for arousing and strengthening denominationalism. In other words, denominationalism is a bad thing. We will not have the place or the opportunity for the theological arguments. No room will be provided for polemics about the greatness of one denomination or faith and the weakness of another. We are aware of uh, secular nationalist ideas and want these to be the greater to take greater hold in the hearts and minds. We are all the sons of one nation, Bnunit Kha Umta or Khamillat, from the same flesh and blood and possess one language. It is our intention to elevate the ethics of our people, to indoctrinate them into accepting the foundations and pillars that uphold our faith, which we accept without opposition. So what is being said here is fits within the understanding, the theoretical framework that was advocated by Gellner and others, a lot of what is said here is uh, brings together the ideas that although um, John Berulli or um, Benedict Anderson or Ernest Gellner did not study the Assyrians per se, they really understood how nationalism worked in terms of it being sort of a modern phenomenon. And here we see the Assyrian case from Assyrian voices that really fits that picture. 
Times are changing. Our nation is being divided. The world is uh, in a conflict. Um, Russia is pressing against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire and Qajar Iran are in a possible conflict. And so the Assyrians are caught in between in this transforming world. Where do we stand? Do we continue to be divided entities? Is that the best for us? Or do we come together? And the editors and the writers in Kihwa, which included Benjamin Arsanis, uh, also, and Freydun Aturaya, uh, uh, Dr. Freydun Aturaya, and Hakim Baba Parhat, and others advocated a new secular understanding of the nation. So, Syrian intellectuals were, were well aware of the advances being made by other ethnic groups within the Ottoman Empire, such as the Armenians, for example. This was particularly true, and the Greeks. This was particularly true among the Assyrians of Urmia who under the prevailing rivalries of their newly adopted churches, again, Russian Orthodox, American Evangelical, were becoming increasingly aware of the necessity to secularize their community and later nationality. Importantly as well, they were acquiring a Western education and an awareness about the Western world through the increase in communication and printing. A la Benedict Anderson. Now, across the Assyrian landscape towards the west in Kharput, where a community of Assyrians lived, the Euphrates College was established in 1876. It was in this college that one of the earliest Assyrian nationalists among the Assyrians, Professor Ashur Yusuf, was educated and later taught. And what did he say? He felt, like the editors of Kihwa, the hindrance before the advancement of the Assyrian people was not so much the attacks from without as it was from within, the doctrinal and sectarian disputes and struggles like Monophysitism, one nature of Christ, Diophysitism, two natures of Christ is a good example. These cause division spiritually and nationally among the people who quarreled among themselves even to the point of shedding blood. To this very day, the Assyrians are still known by terms like Chaldean and uh, Jacobite and Nestorian. Assyrians also, from their own writings, took a, with their, because of their encounter with Westerners, took pride in their past. And according to one priest, for those who thought that priests could not be nationalists or patriarchs could not be nationalists and could not participate, well, according to uh, Professor Gott of Tel Aviv, well, here is Kasha Yosef Gabriel of Khosrawa. Salamas. All the wisdom of other nations drew its origins from the Chaldeans, and all the sciences flow from the east into the uh, remaining regions of the world. As the Latins from the Greeks, so the Greeks from the others received all sciences, which they later cultivated, first from the Chaldeans or Assyrians, which means the same thing. And again, I need to emphasize, because sometimes we, we understand this terminology do not understand these terms, Chaldean and Assyrian, or even Syriac, Suraya, Keldaya, Aturaya, as being separate at this time. They are terms that bring a people together. And although the advocacy was for the term Assyrian to be at the forefront to represent all the rest, and as the priest here from Salama says, tells us, Assyrian or Chaldean, which means the same thing, um, the goal was to bring uh, people together regardless of how they were defined. And, and others use terminology like um, uh, Assyro-Chaldean, for example, in the French, which is still in use today in France for the community. Um, and others used sometimes Chaldean, Chaldaya, uh, even for the people living in the Hakkadi, and others used Aturaya, but they were synonymous. As the priest says, which means the same thing. It meant the same thing for people like Hormuz Rassam, for example, and others, including Laird. Laird saw these terms as being uh, really synonyms of each other. Freydun Aturaya was a very important, Freydun Bet Oraham, labeled Aturaya, was a very important 
a personality among the early nationalists. He was a physician uh, born in the town of Charbash uh, in the district of Urmi in Iran. He sent, uh, was sent by his father to live with his uncle in Tbilisi, Georgia, then in the Russian Empire and studied medicine there. After the February 1917 revolution, Freyd Al-Turaya, Binyamin Ersanis, and Baba Parhat founded the very first Assyrian political party, the Assyrian Socialist Party, and drafted something called the Urmia Manifesto. Al-Turaya completed in 1917 um, an Urmia Manifesto of the United Free Assyria to proclaim the goal of the Free Assyrian Unity is to establish in the future the national self-governing um, national self-governing in the regions of Urmia, Mosul, Tur Abdin, uh, Jazeera, uh, Julamark, and with reunification with the great free Russia in terms of economic and military agreements. So Freydun Aturaya, like many, although he was at the forefront, he was on the cutting edge, if you will, of the nationalist um, uh, intellectual clique uh, here, was advocating for the creation of an Assyrian socialist entity that encompassed all Assyrian regions. It was time to unite the Assyrians together. And there's a very interesting book um, called um, Urmia in the Shadow of the Owl, which is actually a written by uh, Ora Jacobi. It was, it's a story of, it's a novel uh, based on um, true accounts um, about uh, Jews in Urmia, a, a Jewish family in Urmia, which flees in Urmia, but which also talks about, interestingly, Freydun Aturaya and the angry reaction to Freydun's demands by um, the uh, patriarch of the Church of the East, uh, Mar Binyamin, and Marshamun Binyamin. And the reason that, uh, and it's, I find it fascinating, although there are no sources to this, of course, it's, it's, it's a fictional account, but there is allegedly a letter that um, we are searching for, which we will find apparently written by the patriarch against the um, advocacy uh, espoused by Freydun uh, Bet Oraham or Freydun Aturaya. And I am now um, going through various documents written by, uh, written in the 1920s in correspondence between um, Suleiman Betkolia uh, to uh, a number of people here in the United States, in Chicago specifically, in 1926 and 27, that talk about the gathering in Russia of the Assyrian. Um, of the uh, Assyrian Assembly, Khuyada um, Aturaya, at Russia. And there's, there are very interesting references to the statements made by Freydun Bet Oraham uh, and what he espouses. Uh, very clearly, one of the leading fiery romantic nationalists uh, of the time was Freydun Aturaya, who wrote many poems. And in his famous poem, you no doubt heard many of you have heard of Ya Nishra Tchume, or Nishra, Eagle of Tchume. Uh, he, he imagines the Assyrian landscape from Urmia to Mosul. So this is something new in kind of re-envisioning a greater Assyria, if you will, greater than, than what existed before, greater certainly than, than um, uh, Urmia and uh, uh, Hakari alone or, or Tur Abdin alone. So what Freydun Aturaya sought was the bringing together of his people. Um, in other words, creating superimposing like the Zionists, if you will, superimposing this understanding of the Assyrian entity upon the existing fragmented, fragmented tribal and sectarian um, pieces that had formed what he perceived to be the Assyrian nation. And him and his, others like him, you know, were very critical of the existing order. And one of them was Binyamin Arsanis, who wrote very forcefully in Kichwa 
Uh, if we write truthfully, we as a nation are nothing. We do not even possess a name. We very much resemble the inhabitants of the forest existing without pondering our identity. We're not thinking about um, We're not thinking about our identity. How could we not do this? How could we not understand that nations are changing, they're transforming, the world is a changing place. We should also think of ourselves as a nation and we should agree upon a name we should not have three names so he wrote this in an article called we are we are assyrians not chaldeans and syriacs it's first such article written and it kind of leads one to believe that this is also part of uh, a new movement, although not technically separating, um, he's he's approaching it from a very um, a very um, academic, overly intellectual uh, understanding of history. But he is advocating for the oneness of our people. He is not saying that we are not these people who are Chaldeans or these people who are Syriacs. Certainly not the vision that Marufaya Sako has not the vision that Marsaka had, that we are Syriacs and they are Syrian and the two are, the twain shall never meet, not that. He is saying we, all of us, as Freydun Aturai envisioned from Mosul to Urmia, all of us are one nation and we should possess this name and we should advocate for this name. That is what he is saying. And his call is also echoed by members of the Syrian Orthodox Church like Naum Thayyak, who tells us, tells the people, wake up, son of Assyria, awake and see the world, how enlightened the chance is fleeing from us, and time is running out. All of these messages from all of these early nationalists, these voices in the wilderness, were calling upon the Assyrians. Time is passing. We need to do this. Awake, son of Assyria, awake. In vengeance, you will take refuge rise up and band together to strengthen, again, from Urmia to Mosul. And if one does not awake, we have lost our chance. Without a purpose, misfortune will befall our land. Now, although the number of Jacobite and Chaldean indi individuals were, na were nationalists, like Naum Thayyip, like Ashur Yusuf, the movement among Jacobites and Chaldean Syriac Orthodox and Chaldeans was extremely confined in the area, I should say, of the Nineveh Plain and Tor ad -Din, and it was subjected to internal resistance. Among the clergy in particular, there was grave concern that nationalism would mean ruin in those particular examples, for they possessed institutions that were geographically too close to Ottoman rule, and after the First World War to Arab seats of power. Unlike <clears throat> The Assyrian Nestorians, or I apologize for the use of this term, Church of the East of Hakaria Nurmia, they were also significantly more integrated into the economic and social life of the larger societies that surrounded them. Another concern of the clergy was power. Secular nationalist leadership would naturally undermine the influence of the church. So keep this in mind as we discuss the early nationalists and remember the words of Mar Luis Sacco to the leadership of the uh, Kurdistan regional government about separating our people. Benjamin Ersanis, Frey Donaturai, and Baba Parhad again founded the Assyrian Socialist Party. Unfortunately, that party did not succeed. Um, Benjamin Ersanis left Urmia to go to Iraq eventually, then emigrated to Russia. Baba Parhad uh, escaped um, uh, Urmia to Iraq and raised his family and died in 1951 in Baghdad. Uh, Freydun Aturai, of course, uh, is supposedly poisoned in prison. Um, there were correspondence from Freydun, ba uh, Freydun Aturai to Baba Parhad, none of which survived. And I have this um, very reliable source from our own family that Freydun and Binyamin Ersanis and Baba Parhat, while Baba Parhat was in Iraq and Mosul, used to correspond with each other. 
And those letters, unfortunately, were destroyed because of fear from the Iraqi government in the 1970s. Um, Babel Parhat eventually um, went to Urmia and advocated for him, his wife, his family. Uh, they had, uh, by the way, 24 children, uh, 10 of whom survived to uh, go into Baghdad, one of whom is Dr. Malcolm Parhad, who uh, came to the United States and was a very prominent doctor, and his children uh, are also doctors. His father was a doctor. In Iraq, Dr. Baba Parhad advocated an education for his sons, his family, and other Assyrians, a realistic approach to politics, and dampened the idealism and vision of Freydun Aturaya, meaning let's not go too far with the plan of from Urmia to Mosul. Prior to the Semele massacre, he advocated finding a solution with the Iraqi government and away from British influence. And he was very uh, close um, with Malik Khoshaba of Lower Tiari in understanding that um, the demands of our people should be very limited and we should not ask for too much. Um, of course, he advocated maintaining the existence of the Assyrians, but in a more cultural and educational setting. 